Welcome to the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Today is Saturday, June 22nd, 2013, and we are broadcasting live on the Freedomizer Radio Network. In this episode, we'll discuss what's in the news, review a unique fire starting technique, and speak to our special guest, Rhonda Ursulak of Nature's Backpack. This is your host. A.D. Venture. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Wolfman. How you doing there today, everyone? Oh, we're having a. I'm having a great day today, and uh, I'm just really excited about today's show. And we've got a lot of great things to talk about, and uh, we've had some really great weather in uh, southern Ontario just for the past week, uh, actually, and we celebrated the start of summer uh, with some great hot weather in the upper 30 degrees Celsius, and we even had uh, some great times this week, actually, Wolf. Uh, Why don't you tell a little more about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it looks like that summer has finally arrived in uh, in the our sections of Canada and North America. I mean, it has been beautiful out. I mean, the sun has been shining, and uh, all in all, it's just been it's just been really nice. We're starting to get to that uh, you know to that nice time of year again. Really happy about that. Um, you know, as as uh, you know, as we work in the, in the outdoor education field, basically the nice weather is when our clients arrive, right? So it is uh, it's pretty awesome. Well, we've had some great things uh, going on this week for Barefoot Bushcraft, and uh, we actually hosted a homeschool skills day for a bunch of uh, kids aged 6 to 12 recently at uh, a camp and conference center in southern Ontario, and uh, I had a great time. The day just flew by, and we taught some uh, a really great bunch of kids uh, a lot of useful skills, and, and they showed a lot of promise, a lot of interest, and a lot of curiosity and, and, and willingness to try new things. I was very impressed and, and very inspired to see that uh, there is a segment of, uh, of the youth that are actually quite interested in the outdoors and uh, primitive skills as well as uh, risk management and, and uh, survival preparedness. It was a really great uh, – it was a great course. Um, I, I really enjoyed working with the homeschoolers. Uh, at one point, we were doing a small section on starting fires using um, uh, using the ferro rods. And, uh, you know, we did our little talk about it, and we got everybody – gave everybody some little pieces of cotton. And we had this um, this little young boy. He was like five years old or something like that. And um, he, takes, he takes a ferro rod, and he strikes it. And it was like, wow, he got fire. I was like yelling. I'm like, yeah, I was so happy for him. And, you know, he was five. He was like, eh. <laughs> so it was a really wonderful day. Uh, and and, and like, uh, like AD Venture said, holy Hannah, it went fast. It was like, you know, we had everything all timed out. We had our itinerary set up. And by the time we got through the first couple of things that we had wanted to, you know, some opening circle games and, uh, you know, just some group skills games, it was like half our, half our day was over already. It was fantastic. I really had a good time. Uh, and most importantly, we got to teach the next generation of, of youth some of these primitive skills to instill a love of nature and wonderment of nature uh, at a young age. Hopefully the things that they learn today will follow them for the rest of their rest of their lives. What do you think, A.D.? That's quite true, yes. Uh, and these skills not only help them uh, with um, t- technical skills, uh, how to start a fire, how to build a, sh- build a shelter, but it also provides them with the ability to socialize with their peers, uh, meet new friends, and just to... to um, to be outdoors and learn in a very comfortable and safe setting. And if you're actually interested about uh, the homeschool program that we have available, please go to our website at www.barefootbushcraft.com. It's actually under the courses section and just look for homeschool programs. And we're uh, actually looking to expand that a little further and provide a few more uh, courses for older uh, youth as well as adults as well, adult educators that um, whose primary job is to uh, to teach these homeschool kids, uh, we're definitely quite excited about um, the offerings that we're planning to uh, roll out quite soon. All right, so now we're going to move into our next segment. In the news. This week in the news, 
We're discussing actually the flooding in Alberta that just happened on uh, Friday morning. And uh, the capital, Calgary, has actually been shut down. Over 100,000 people have been evacuated. Currently, there are three confirmed dead. And from one uh, tale that I've heard, the water rose from ankle level to chest level in only about 40 minutes. And it apparently was a, a flash flood of unprecedented scale that um, caught everyone off uh, by surprise and was, uh, was actually devastating to, to much of the uh, lower area of the province of Alberta. Now, um, Wolf, uh, you, you had mentioned that you knew people out there and uh, some had been communicating with you. Uh, what, what were they telling you about uh, the situation there? Uh, well, yeah, I have some people that I have known uh, over the years who have moved out in that direction. And, uh, and there's pictures of, like, walking paths that they would normally cycle every day. And uh, the one guy, I'm not going to mention his name on the radio, but he was saying that uh, it was, like, right up to the seat of his bicycle that, uh, that he was trying to get to work today. And, I mean, and if you can imagine, you know, people think of their bug-out bags and bug-in equipment and all this stuff. But, I mean, there was really no time for this. It was just like, bam, it happened in half an hour, 45 minutes. And although it's very easy to say, oh, your stuff can be replaced, it's, it's much more than that. It's much more devastating when things like this happen. Um, what about things that you had to quickly leave behind? I mean, 100,000 people are being evacuated. Imagine the, um, the, 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 the hassle and the... The uh, just the headache that that must be from a risk management point of view to make sure everybody stays safe. Um, security guards and police and search and rescue working around the clock, at, you know, working themselves to the bone trying to get this situation under control. It's just, it's incredible. I mean, we you know we prepare for it, they train for it, we do all of this, but really until it happens, it's an incredible thing. If you go onto YouTube and you look up. Uh, there are thousands of videos that people have taken. Uh, some of them are kind of funny, actually. You know, there's like people on, uh, you know, on like uh, those uh, floating pool mats floating around in city streets with a drink in their hand, trying to make the best of the situation. Uh, but if you can imagine, all of the very sacred treasures in your family history are in danger, right? All the, you know, your your family memories, your photo albums, your collectibles from your great grandparents or whatever, all in danger. It's very, very scary and very, very unfortunate for everybody that's uh, that's going through that right now. And unfortunately, not a whole lot of preparedness can really help you when it happens that fast. What do you think, A.D.? Well, that's quite true, actually. There's uh, very few things that you can do. Uh, you can try to stay prepared. There are certain tips that um, are, are quite good to follow in regards to uh, preparedness as well as um, evacuation, which is uh, quite important as well because a lot of uh, individuals there in Calgary can't get back to their homes, to their possessions. So it's, just as Wolf had mentioned, it's a very good idea to have access to a bug-out bag or some sort of bag that is ready and available, has all your necessary uh, um, gear, equipment, uh, perhaps a store of food, and is ready in case one of these situations does occur. And it's just a good idea to have one available for just about any, any sort of situation. But it, it specifically in regards to flooding, uh, what would be a good thing to, to do? For example, if you're stuck at home, uh, turn off all your power and all your gas lines and remain on upper floors and wait for instructions from the authorities. But what you should also remember is never go into an attic, uh, especially ones that don't have... Uh, any sort of uh, windows uh, or access out to the roof because there was many cases out in um, Louisiana during the Katrina floodings that uh, a lot of people died inside their attics because they were unable to get out. And a few people actually brought some axes with them and were able to cut their way through. But uh, it's, it's definitely something you don't want to do is, is go into an area where you can't get out once the, the floodwaters have uh, prevented you uh, access uh, away from there. Uh, now, if you're outside, uh, you want to stay away from any sort of water source, and you can get away. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to get to higher ground or elevated areas and try to remain safe and visible, especially for the uh, search authorities who would be able to see you. If you're caught close to the water, you can uh, definitely get uh, caught and swept away quite quickly by moving current. And a lot of those videos that Wolf had mentioned show the, the massive torrents that when I was doing these videos, I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing because it literally looks like a, a huge flow that uh, is just unstoppable. It, it's literally going at uh, 
a, a fast speed where if someone were to, to slip in, you'd lose sight of them almost in an instant. That's how quick the water is going. So it was, it's very important to stay away from any sort of moving currents or, or waters. Uh, now, if you're stuck in a car, you're definitely going to want to get out of the vehicle and try to head to higher ground. Leave, leave the vehicle. Don't, don't worry about that. Uh, now, if you can't, um, try to be careful when driving and um, try to get out of that area as, as quick as possible but without flooding your vehicle. Uh, but understand that you, some, some of these puddles uh, can be a lot deeper than, uh, than you think. So it's very important to uh, just try to be aware of the environment that you're going to be driving through. Now, things to bring when evacuating your home in the case of a flooding, obviously, are your pets. Any sort of important medication, definitely some sort of ident identification, uh, money, uh, and food supplies. Uh, canned goods, non-perishables are especially good. Um, and you can find things like uh, tuna or baked beans, and they carry a lot of protein and, and can keep you going in the uh, 48 to 72 hours that might uh, follow an event like this when the authorities can't get out to uh, assist you further. Now, uh, what you want to consider to do in the aftermath of this sort of thing is you want to continue to take these sort of precautions, listen to and follow the directions from local authority, and you only return home when the officials have declared it safe to do so. You can actually be charged for going back into areas that have been uh, evacuated. Um, now, when you're returning home, before entering, you want to look outside for any sort of damage, any loose power lines, damaged gas lines, foundation cracks or anything. Parts of your home might be damaged, so you want to approach this, these areas carefully in case something might uh, give way. Uh, definitely want to stay away from any sort of power lines, any sort of p power source. You also want to discard any food items that might have come in contact with floodwaters, and obviously when you're in doubt, throw it out. Uh, don't use any water that may have been contaminated for either washing, cleaning, drinking, or even food preparation. You want to wear protective materials such as rubber boots and gloves during any sort of cleanup that you might have had in your flooded home. And if you smell any sort of natural or propane gas or hear any sort of hissing noises, leave your home immediately and call 911 so they can get the authorities there to switch any sort of broken main off or anything like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, you have to be very, very careful in these situations because even though the floodwaters may have far receded, you just never know what's going to what's going to end up staying behind. Uh, again, like AD Venture said, it's very important to consider your safety at all costs. Now, one of the things that many people, um, and this came to light in Louisiana when they had all the flooding down there, is that the government has not – prepared because as, as most people know the government is very behind times when it comes to animal rights legislations and things like that they're not prepared to accept you and your dog and your cat and your pets and your turtle and everything else that you may own into these emergency shelters when you get evacuated they are going to expect you to leave your pets behind so if you are uh, uh, like many people who just outright are not interested in do that um, you know that your pets are like your fur babies and your children. You need to be prepared to evacuate in a different manner, other than going into uh, an emergency shelter. Because uh, for whatever reason, the law hasn't caught up yet, and dogs and cats are considered disposable equipment. Um, as, as shameful as that may sound, uh, but it is something to always consider if you if you are going to um, you know you're going to bug out, so to speak, to um, to be concerned about your pet as well. And that's a very unfortunate situation um, when you have to choose between your own, your own safety and the safety of your pets, at least for many people. I know there's some people out there that they don't care, but uh, many, many people do. That's true. Now, just going back to the story, I want to uh, elaborate a little more for our listeners. Um, currently, the Canadian forces have uh, dispatched at least uh, 400 uh, personnel who are joining RCMP officers and they're assisting with uh, searches and as well as evacuations. Uh, Prime Minister Harper has also been touring the area and uh, has promised to earmark uh, federal funds to assist with uh, the disaster relief. There are several areas within uh, Alberta that have been declared emergency areas, and they're uh, currently conducting those, uh, those searches for any, uh, any potential victims, and they're also assessing damage. And there are other communities that are preparing for uh, more flooding uh, downstream. 
for example, from uh, Calgary, there are a lot of communities that we're bracing for uh, potential flooding today. And uh, we're just right now waiting word to see how uh, how that's going to go. But uh, all our thoughts and prayers are with uh, with all the uh, uh, victims of these, this flooding, and we hope to see a quick re- resolution to the situation. Now, what we're going to do is move on to our next segment. Tips and Tricks. This week in our Tips and Tricks segment, we're going to discuss a Swedish fire log, which is a very unique way of starting a fire. And we're also going to discuss a little more about Pinterest for our barefoot bushcraft. So why don't you take it away, Wolf, and let us know a little more. All right. Um, Sure. Well, we will start uh, with the Swedish fire log. So uh, myself and uh, one of our part-time instructors, uh, we were just sitting around the fire one day and said, hey, you know what? Actually, we were filming some other barefoot bushcraft things. Said, hey, you know, we would really like to try this Swedish fire thing. So um, we, we did an improvised Swedish fire. And basically how that works is you take a log and you quarter it, but not all the way to the bottom. And then in the holes that the spaces between the logs, you then stuff it full of some kind of tinder, whether it be you know newspaper or whatever. And then you set it on uh, set it ablaze. And what happens is that inside the quartered log will start to blaze. So you're getting the fire going straight up, and you're also creating a flat platform on the top. And this is a really interesting way to create a fire because you could theoretically take a skillet or a pan or a pot and set it right on top of the fire that's already burning. It's a really, really fun project to do. Certainly, if uh, you have the opportunity to try this, it's a great, great way to do it. The easiest, most modern way is to find the log, use a chainsaw, and cut an X into it. Um, what we did for the video is we just took four – we quartered a piece of wood and then put it together with some cordage uh, to keep it together. And, uh, and set it on fire. But it was, it was a lot of fun to do. It was a really um, very, very simple method to start a fire, but really effectual in that it actually automatically makes cooking fire. So we, I, I really did enjoy that. And um, any comments from you, A.D., about that? Well, why don't you let our, our audience know a little more about how long it took you exactly to put, to, to put together the Swedish fire log. Sure, absolutely. The biggest challenge, I think, for it was getting the natural tinder in the cracks. So, you, again, you have a quartered log um, that's put back together again, and um, you're stuffing all the tinder inside. We had all kinds of natural tinder. We had um, some cattail, and we had just some um, some wood that we had shredded, you know, just using a knife blade into uh, like a feather stick kind of thing. I think that was the most difficult part was uh, was stuffing it in there. Then once you get it going, the nice thing is because you have now two like four little slots of uh, packed tinder, you light it at the bottom, and the fire naturally goes upward. And when the fire goes upward, it's going to dry out any of the moisture in the upper sections and uh, and get it started. Because of the way that we filmed the video doing what we call a modified Swedish fire by basically wrapping the log a pre-split log together. Um, in some of the outtakes at the end of the video, we'll see, you will see that it has it fell over a couple times. It was kind of fun. Um, but if you did it where you're you're cutting into a log and it's the bottom is still all connected and it's not fully quartered, it's a really really great system to put together. Easy to put together. Uh, again, it only took 10, 10, 15 minutes to get it all set up, and it was just a spur of the moment thing. But it, it made for a good video. It's fun to watch. And uh, yeah, all over it was uh, it was pretty good. Now, um, for our audience here on Freedomizer Radio, checking out the chat program, you can check out the link which I've just posted, as well as the stories in the previous segment, and you can also check that video out on our YouTube channel. That's www.youtube.com/barefootbushcraft, and the O's are zeros. I got to say, Wolf, it was very enjoyable to see the the video itself. It was uh, it looked very easy, and uh, it it looked like it got very hot very quickly, and um, definitely quite useful for uh, for a camping fire as well as the, uh, for cooking as well. Yeah, if, like if you don't have a grill, 
this is like a really great way to make like a true bushcraft grill. You know, you've got a skillet or whatever it is that you're going to put on top of it. And as soon as it heats up, you know, the, the heat of the flame, of course, goes straight up right into the bottom. Uh, so you're going to get a really nice fire and it burns from the inside out. So it's relatively stable if you want to like cook an omelet or something on it. So uh, that, that was really, really kind of fun. So I guess the next thing we'll talk about quickly is Pinterest. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, Pinterest is um, can be kind of a mystery. It's a fairly new site. It was only it came on operation maybe a year or so ago. Basically, what it is is it's a a virtual pin board of images. So you log into your Pinterest account, and then you decide to um, you decide to look under some categories. So say like outdoor education, nature, um, bushcraft, something like that. You get a bunch of p images will come on your screen. So there'll be like, say, for example, a picture of a knife or something. You can then take that picture and you can pin it to your own Pinterest so you can keep track of all of these. So we've created a Pinterest page for Barefoot Bushcraft, which is, of course, uh, Pinterest.com forward slash BF Bushcraft. It's also, of course, available directly from our website. So when you go on there, you will find all kinds of really great animations, a couple of videos. You're going to find all kinds of um, – bushcraft and outdoor related stuff including different pictures uh, and a lot of how-to stuff lots and lots of how-to stuff how to make things like mucklucks and uh, sandals and all sorts of really really just great things as well as more like you know want lists like some uh, there's some beautiful firearms on there and there's uh, all sorts of just things that you look at these pictures and it's like wow how beautiful including stuff as well that we can't own like you know big huge automatic gatling guns and tanks and stuff but uh, yeah, it's a fun website. One thing that I noticed that uh, is quite intriguing, and I'm sure that our listening audience would love to see these sorts of things, are the little diagrams that show particular techniques to use for either survival skills or fire starting, even leather work, wilderness first aid. Uh, oh, it's just absolutely beautiful to see these little diagram displays and how easy it is just to follow them. And there's quite a few, and we're always adding a lot more. So be sure to check that link uh, with us, and uh, you'll be able to see a lot more on Pinterest. So check it out, pinterest.com forward slash BF Bushcraft, and you'll see a ton of different great pictures, videos, and uh, diagrams, as uh, both Wolf and I just mentioned. Yeah, and we're adding stuff literally daily. I mean, Pinterest is designed... Uh, without getting into too much of the mechanics, it's got a mobile site, right? So, you know, if we're sitting somewhere at an appointment or whatever and we have some time to waste, we can go online and look it up. And again, uh, like AD Venture was saying, there's all kinds of tutorials on there. And if you click on the picture, it will take you to a website. So say you see a... Um, I don't know, say you see a product you want, you see a knife blade or something that you have to have, uh, you click on it, it'll take you to the website where you can get either more information on it or purchase it or something like that. Uh, so there's a, it's a really, uh, for people in the, in, in the bushcraft, camping, and outdoor, it's a really great resource for people like us because you never know what we can find. So there's, if you're into paracord, uh, we actually have a folder just on paracord, like paracord projects. There's tons of stuff on there. Uh, for paracord projects, everything from, you know, bracelets to keychains to belts to every and everything in between. All right. On that note, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we get back, we're going to speak to Rhonda Ursulak of Nature's Backpack. This is AD Venture and the Wolfman, and we'll see you on the other side. You know the Constitution like the back of your hand. You've read books, listened to podcasts attended lectures, surfed websites, and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal, but something seems to be missing. Stickers from LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait. There's more. You can buy Liberty Stickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to LibertyStickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. LibertyStickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. 
Get ready for the epic new documentary adventure ride of your life. Shade the motion picture. Hub you into the globalist domain and embellish a Burma's film. Nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. Governments do not operate the way you think they do. Banks do not do what you think they do. The police department is not here for what you think it is. Nothing in your world works the way you think it does. We have never let them know that their world government has been identified and they thought they just quote the world economy to bring in a worldwide police state, but it's a dead it's gonna bring them down. You have to stand up. Speak up, speak out. Shade the motion picture. Order your copy of the DVD today at Shade the Motion Picture. This is Mercy. If you're listening to this message, warriors, you are the resistance. Warriors, you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. Read about it in the Sovereign, newspaper of the resistance. Available now at newsstands everywhere. The Sovereign is a monthly 24-page tabloid newspaper featuring incendiary content about life during wartime in the age of Obama. Warriors, keep to date every month. Remember to read The Sovereign, newspaper of the resistance. Available at newsstands everywhere. This alert is for all you boppers out there in the big city, all you street people with an ear for the action. This is Mercy. If you're listening to this message, Warriors, you are the resistance. This is Mercy. Mine will be the last voice you will ever hear. Don't be alarmed. Does the media ever deceive the public? A white plane, a very big jet, was flying in an unusual pattern uh, near the White House over Lafayette Park. Very slowly it made one circle and then... Are the media and their sources trustworthy? New York State and New Jersey will get their first doses of the swine flu vaccine. The H1N1 virus has made thousands of people across the country sick. Many have died. And some worry that it could grow into a full-blown pandemic. Where does our mainstream media get their news? All this enjoyment is brought to you by all the things sweetened with NutraSweet. There's a reason why we want to own these guns. We're going to have to come together and take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this. That was President Obama Friday suggesting it is now time to reopen the national debate on gun control. The media tends to march in lockstep with the government. Who is responsible when the media fabricates the news? When the public is constantly fed messages that that are potentially leading us into a war that may not be necessary, it, it, it's not fair to the American people and it's not fair to journalism because the truth isn't being told here. We found out that CNN International is actually making money from the Bahrain regime. They, they are a, a customer of Bahrain. Bahrain is paying CNN International to create content that shows Bahrain in a favorable light to then air that content on CNN International. Join us online at williamlewisfilms.com. That's williamlewisfilms.com. Want to spread awareness to your neighbors, family, and friends about what is going on in our country today? It may be things you already know, like the large number of FEMA camps spread around this country to lock up citizens like you and me. What legislators are doing to strip states and people of their sovereign rights. Or legislation giving states the power to force vaccinate under a declared state of emergency. Do your neighbors understand what is going on? William Lewis Films offers the perfect tools to inform our population about this government's tyrannical shift from a constitutional republic to a despotic democracy. Films like 911 Ripple Effect, Beyond Treason, One Nation Under Siege, Washington You're Fired, Camp FEMA, Enemy of the State, Don't Tread on Me, Blood of Patriots, The Ron Paul Uprising, even 911 in Plain Sight, William's first production, are all available at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Get your DVDs today at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Educate against the police state. We are so pleased to announce ESP Botanicals is now sponsoring Freedomizer Radio. They have a bath and body line of products made for keeping your skin beautiful and healthy. But it's also for psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, and dermatitis treatments. 
They are meticulously prepared skincare products made from the best botanicals available. Committed to buying only from the growers when they can and using the highest quality cold pressed oils, botanical organic additives, the best steam express essential oils, and the least processed carrier oils that are available in today's marketplace. Pamper yourself for someone special in your life. Give the gift of beautiful glowing skin. ESP botanicals.com. Thank you so much for supporting us at Freedomizer Radio. Welcome back to the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. This is AD Venture, joined by my co-host, The Wolfman. And today we're going to welcome a very special guest, Rhonda Ursulak of Nature's Backpack. Thanks for joining us, Rhonda. Thanks for having me. I like that introduction. All right. So, um, so Rhonda, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about who you are and what you do? Uh, because I know you're into the outdoor education field. Sure can, yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Rhonda Urslack. I live down here in Milton, Ontario. And I run a business called Nature's Backpack. And the whole purpose of that is to reconnect people to to nature. And I start with the young ones, with uh, the little three- to five-year-olds and that. Um, and I also offer hikes to people. I just came back this morning from offering a barefoot hike for families in the surrounding areas as well. And offer education, outdoor education to teachers through the Canadian Wildlife Federation, through the Project Wild uh, program, which is a lot of fun. So it keeps me hopping. That's amazing. That sounds really great. And just I want to let all our listeners know here on Freedomizer Radio that I've put uh, your website address into our chat program. And for all those that don't have access to the chat program, the website address is www.naturesbackpack.ca. Now, I have to ask you, Ron, I'm quite interested. How did you get started in this field? That is quite the journey and quite the story, actually. Um, my background actually is in environmental sciences. That's what I went through, through school for and did a lot of work with working with children. And at the time when I was first getting interested in getting more outside for myself, I worked at an earlier center for, for children and was taking them out on a, on a nature experience at one of the local conservation areas. And while we were there, I just noticed that there was a lot of fear with these parents and these children whenever they were in the outdoors and a lot of the fear of not allowing them to touch anything. One time we had a, a frog jump out in front of us and uh, the kids instinctively would try to grab it and I just noticed the parents were trying to hold them back and not let them touch it or experience any of that. And so I, I was saddened by that in thinking when I was a child, I was a wild child, always outside, always, you know, bringing home frogs and stray animals and everything, and I was noticing that these children weren't having these kinds of experiences themselves. They were even afraid of a fly. So I went home and immediately felt like I had to do something about that, and that's when I started my nature hikes for, for parents and families, and I did it for free. I didn't charge for it, and the whole purpose of that was just to get people to come out and be more comfortable outdoors and find out where some places that they can go locally that are free so it doesn't cost them anything and they can get their families outside. So that's how it started. And um, it went on further from that when I felt like um, there was m more of a need for this type of mentoring or education out there for families and youth. So. I put together some programs, which is what I run now. I do programs for uh, young kids, um, still do my hikes, and uh, I also have a girls club that I just started as well where it's mentoring girls between the ages of 9 and 14 in just some bushcraft skills, outdoor skills, that will um, just so that they can build their own confidence and know what their strengths and weaknesses are. In themselves so um, it's an ever-building 
journey and business that's growing. Wow, that's a really beautiful thing to to hear how how you know you, you've come from one thing and sort of morphed into into becoming an authority in the field, and that's 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 pretty wild. So, um, what kind of formal like formal experiences I, 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 do you have uh, in this in the field? I know nowadays, unfortunately, the world is going where you know diplomas and stuff mean more than anything else, and a lot of us now have been forced to go in that direction. Yeah. Um... I'm not so sure if having having that formal education is becoming as important as it used to be, but um, my formal education is a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences, and I specialized in aquatic biology, so that's my degree that I went through school for. Um, but further from that, a lot of experience working with youth groups and with like um, a local field naturalist groups here. Uh, working with the youth. I have been a nature interpreter at local conservation areas here and uh, I've taken a lot of courses, some uh, survival skills and bushcraft skill courses in the last uh, few years. Um, some of the other experiences that I've had is, is um, heading up different committees and associations that pertain to some environmental issues. I was part of an environmental committee that I head up for our cottage association to protect our lake, and we're actually in the process of, of writing up a lake plan to protect our lake because the municipality is just starting to write an official plan for their municipality. So that's interesting because uh, more of a political side, <laughs> but I am not. Uh, I'm not. That's not my strength. So I I rely on some of the other people to help me with that one, um, and also just just. Um, Working with kids, I've been working with kids for the past 15 years in different different types of capacities, whether it's at the earlier center or at a conservation area or with youth groups through that as well. And uh, also have become a certified Ontario hike leader as well. That's great to hear. It's amazing to, to hear about all the different things that you're doing currently and uh, as you've already mentioned to our audience, you're, you're involved with Nature's Backpack, giving out these great courses, empowering uh, girls with all these different skills and experiences. But um, I know that you're, there's a little more to you, actually. I know that you're involved with Project Wild, um, Mark Morey, and even AOM. Is that the Association of Midwives? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, oh. power to the midwives. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, AOM I is... I wrong here. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, AOM is the uh, Art of Mentoring, which is uh, a community-based movement that um, is guided through Mark Moray, who is down in Vermont. And uh, the Art of Mentoring is connecting communities back together through through nature. And uh, oh, it's hard to explain, but it's um, connecting setting up communities together where they're more connected to each other and you have that relationship of passing down knowledge and skills and um, uh, beliefs, traditions from our elders down to the new children that are, are being born and uh, just building that sense of community that it includes nature so that now you're living with nature instead of on top of it. And whereas, you know, uh, we're we're creatures who are supposed to be connected, and our culture is very disconnected. And you can see that through our through our innate nature that we do crave that in when things happen. For example, when we lost electricity in Ontario for I forget how long it was for a day or two, and how the community all came together, brought out their barbecues and cooked up all their food because the fridges were were defrosting and everyone just came together as a community and cele- celebrated not having electricity kind of thing and everyone and everyone talked about how great it was and so with uh, the art of mentoring it brings some of that back so that we can bring back some of those traditions of how it used to be before we were so disconnected from each other and disconnected from nature Wow. Now, I have taken, actually, the uh, the Art of Mentoring, and it was a pretty powerful course. It went um, 
it was an experience for me where I started out and it was like a lot of this stuff is silly. This is what my campers do. I'm not interested in smelling a crayfish or all the other silly things. Um, but by the end of the week, and I think the course is five or six days, is it? That's right. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Um, you sort of learn to let go of that that shielding, and it's like, and you learn to get. At, at least for me, the experience was, I sort of I got into it, and it was like, wow. You know, it, it brought that wonderment back into my life, and it was a very powerful, powerful experience. Uh, and we talk an awful lot on the show about um, about tribal experiences and cultural experiences and how so many of us in the North, North American-type environments, we lose that sense of ritual. We lose that sense of, of culture just in the way that we live, and it's, we don't have those rites of passage anymore. And uh, that's, isn't that something that Mark Morey uh, talks about, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, and he offers programs that that allow for rites of passages for our youth and even for adults who never did go through those rites of passages can go back and experience that for themselves as well. Um, I I have yet to do it, but I look forward to the day when I can. (laughs) I think it would be very powerful, and I think in the youth today, they're kind of lost. They don't really know where they fit in or what they're supposed to do. Um, because everyone is so busy that they just don't offer these types of traditions in the family or the traditions are lost when people move here to Canada, whereas I think traditions should be embraced no matter where you're from and and celebrated as part of your, as part of your heritage. You know, Rhonda, I have to ask you, with all this talk about the art of mentoring, uh, what do you think about the current state of outdoor education here in Ontario? Mm. Uh, okay, where do I start with that? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. And um, being part of Project Wild as well, because I work with teachers, uh, I can see the frustrations with the teachers. A lot is being put on to that education with the teachers, and the communication to them isn't, isn't um, clear. Uh, I learned through la- a couple months ago. I did a, a big training of teachers for a school board, and there's actually a large mandate for outdoor education that comes from the school board, but it's not being passed down to where, to teacher level, to the front lines. And it is all about experiential and the inquiry of the outdoors, which is also also part of what the art of mentoring is all about too. It's all about that experiential like like what Wolf said, smelling that crayfish or, you know, writing a poem about the dead crayfish, um and experiencing it and then asking questions about what is going on, like how did this crayfish die? Why is it here? Um, making all these these inquiries which could cause someone to go into action. Um, so that that's the mandate of the school boards that that they do have, but they are not. They're just starting to communicate that to the front lines, which are the teachers. So I do see it is changing, but uh, a lot of I don't think a lot of people are trained or knowledgeable in the outdoors that they don't feel like they can teach it. Which with the teachers that I was teaching with Project Wild course, um, I made them aware that you don't necessarily need to know the answer because of the way that you ask the questions and explore it together with your class, that you can find those answers together. So I do find that um, it is changing, especially since Richard Liu came out with his book, The Last Child in the Woods, and coined the the phrase um, uh, nature deficit disorder that awareness of the benefits of outdoor education and being outside is growing. So I find that it is changing. It may be slow, but it is starting to change. At least I'd like to believe so. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, now, I, I was the, the organization I'm involved with right now has something called um, the Headwaters Program. Now, it's not like the Headwaters Gathering that um, goes on in Ontario, but it's an outdoor education program where students – um, in the Guelph area, get to live at this camp um, for a while, and they go there every day. 
uh, and everything I seem to be learning about, I think it's called Kelp, C-E-L-P. Um, you, once they start, they go on a winter camping trip, but they have to, like, make their own mucklucks in order to go on this camping trip and then wear them all weekend. And they get to learn all sorts of things about natural gardening and make all of their own, like, all the bushcrafty type projects. And it's an amazing experiential program. And I talk to these students about it, and they they glow ear to ear when they're like, I will never wear normal boots again after making these myself. Uh, and it's like, Wow. So I, I definitely can see the value, the value in this, and yeah, I, I wish I could get more involved in the kelp program, uh, which I might do sometime in the future. Mm, that but sounds good. Because, yeah, yeah, it was just amazing. Uh, every time I talk to them, I learn more about it. Uh, it's a great program. So now I know that you're also part of the barefoot movement. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm just new to that. Yeah. <laughs> new to that. Um, uh, I'm new to it. Yeah, I've, I I don't go barefoot all the time, but I do like hiking barefoot. Well, any chance that I can get to go and take my socks and shoes off, I will take it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So how has that been for you, from someone who's who's made that transition? I mean, has that increased your uh, your connection with nature through through doing that? It has because. Um, it just it gives you that connection to the earth when you're when you're walking and you become more aware of aware of just how you're walking outside uh, cuz now you can feel it through your feet so if you're walking on rocks or whatever you have to walk you know you have to walk a little bit differently than if you're just walking on grass um and then i find that i'm not as noisy uh, when I'm walking in nature, so I might actually be able to see something rather than having my big, you know, mountaineering boots on that make big vibrations when you're when you're walking through the forest, and uh, and just for uh, the sensations that you feel when you're walking out there, because you know today today when we were walking barefoot, like it was muddy and there was rocks and there was. Uh, moss-covered rocks, and I just made sure that I stepped on it all so that I could just feel all the difference. I even walked through water, um, muddy water, and walked through mud just so that I can get that experience. And I just find that it just connects you more and makes you feel more alive when you're outside. Wow. Now, do you get blisters when you go barefoot? Uh, no, I haven't had blisters. I've had I've had sore feet when I just start out, uh, you know, because your feet are in boots for most of the winter <laughs> so they're a little tender at first but you know once you go out a couple of times they toughen up and i haven't i've never had cuts or blisters or anything when i've gone out barefoot it's strange because blisters are generally caused by like your boot and shoe your boot and socks rubbing together right so then it's right. a hot spot um uh, that's one of the most one of the questions that the media always used to ask me when I was out on the Bruce Trail is, do you get blisters? And it's like I hiked a thousand kilometers and I didn't get a single blister, and that's and they they were really taken by that. And it was like, but you know, once you start to go into the mechanics of it, it's like it makes makes sense that you didn't, and uh, that's really cool. So, mm-hmm. um, do you find yourself like pushing yourself, going further and further into more foreign terrain or more challenging terrain over time? I do, yeah. Once once my feet toughen up a little bit more, um, definitely we'll we'll try more like uh, you know maybe go out to Rattlesnake Point where it's more rocky, uh, do some climbing. I do climb trees in my bare feet, <laughs> so that that can be challenging sometimes. But um, it's nice because I, I find that I'm more agile when when I don't have shoes on. I can. I can grip a, a log if I'm going to start balancing on a log when I'm out in nature. Uh, I can actually, I, I have better balance when I have no shoes on and uh, can walk a lot easier across a log um, in my bare feet. Just because your feet can wow. conform to what you're what you're stepping on and you can grip it better. So, uh, Rhonda, what do you have in store for the future? What, uh, what's planned for Rhonda Oshulak? Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of things are going to be changing. I'm I'm actually going to be moving up north, so I'm looking to expand my business um, to to up north. So down here in Milton, it will be uh, my vision is to mentor families and children from birth to age 14 through different programs, and then up north have more of a rites of passage for 
the, the kids who have come through this mentoring process to come up north and stay with us for a couple of weeks and then end it with a, like a, a, a solo, a 72-hour solo where they have to survive with just a knife and have to find their own water and their food and make their own fire with a bow drill and um, have that sense of accomplishment and that rite of passage of, of the teenager to more of an adulthood. And hopefully my, my hope is that at the end of that, this, these kids who come through this program will have a, a good sense of who they are, uh, where they want to go, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and just have a more rounded understanding of who they are for society. That's great to hear. So we're, we've got a lot to, to look forward to from, uh, from Rhonda Ursulak. So uh, our audience, make sure to check out uh, her website. That's www.naturesbackpack.ca, and you'll learn a lot more about the different services that she offers. Now, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour. It's been uh, just flying by. It's been very enjoyable to have you on our show finally, Rhonda, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and I know it's been a while <laughs> to try and get, get me on there, but I'm really happy to have been on your show. Thank you so much. Well, that's great. Again, this is A.D. Venture, joined by the Wolfman. Thank you for joining us here on Barefoot Bushcraft Radio, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>